Right, thanks for tuning in. Uh, today we are with Matt Bourne talking about the impact of Nordic hamstring and hip extension exercises on hamstring architecture and morphology, implications for injury prevention, which on a second time round uh, is good for half past six in the morning saying all that. So uh, thanks for joining us, Matt, and thanks for tuning in. No, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Good to be here. Do you just want to give us a little bit of uh, a really short intro on, on you and then uh, we'll chat about the paper? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a uh, I'm an exercise scientist uh, by trade. I'm a, a lecturer at the uh, School of Exercise Science at uh, La Trobe University uh, down here in Melbourne. Um, I completed my uh, PhD uh, and honours programs of research uh, up at the Queensland University of Technology, uh, and was supervised by Dr. Anthony Shield uh, up there. Um, so that's where uh, the vast majority of this work has been uh, completed. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that's me. Perfect. So you just want to give us a little bit of um, a background on, on this research and, and why, this, why this area? Yeah, sure. Um, obviously, uh, I'll, along with the, the wider research group, um, we've had a focus on uh, hamstring strain injury uh, for a number of years now. Um, a significant portion of, of my PhD um, focused on uh, the role of exercise selection uh, and specifically how we can um, improve exercise or improve our understanding of exercise selection uh, to reduce injury rates. Um, so it became uh, really blatantly obvious that we've got a very poor uh, understanding of uh, not just the activation patterns uh, of the hamstrings in different exercises, um, but there's also little to no uh, evidence around the morphological and architectural adaptations that we experience from exercise. Um, so this study is really the uh, kind of capstone from uh, three studies. Um, the initial one uh, involved a uh, surface EMG analysis um, of 10 common hamstring exercises. Uh, the purpose of that was really to, to characterise what the hamstrings were doing uh, in a broad range of tasks uh, and to see if we could identify um, the exercise or exercises which seem to really uh, selectively activate the biceps femoris long head. Uh, as you know, eight to nine in 10 injuries affect the biceps femoris long head. So it really suggests that uh, injury prevention and, and rehab strategies should specifically target this muscle to some extent. Um, so as a follow on from that first study, uh, what we saw essentially, um, and, and that was published just earlier this year in the, the British Journal of Sports Med as well, um, we saw that the uh, hip extension oriented exercises, uh, and in particular a 45 degree uh, or a hip extension exercise performed on a 45 degree Roman chair, seemed to most selectively activate the biceps femoris. What was really interesting was that the, the Nordic exercise, which is uh, certainly got the most evidence for it in terms of injury prevention or hamstring injury prevention, seem to least selectively activate biceps fem long head. Uh, however, the Nordic is really, really tough. It's a super maximal exercise. Uh, and what was also interesting was that uh, the level or the magnitude of um, electromyographic activity during the Nordic uh, in biceps femoris long head actually exceeded every other exercise. So, uh, that was essentially what we found. Part two or study two was um, a functional MRI analysis of those two exercises um, to see if we could really just have a better look at what was going on. Um, as we know, surface EMG has got a whole host of limitations, um, probably the biggest of which is, is crosstalk. Um, you know, we, we can't really identify b between uh, closely approximated uh, segments of muscles. Um, or several muscles within a muscle group. Uh, and so we took those two exercises to the scanner uh, and we had a look at what they were doing. We were able to quantify what we call the, the T2 relaxation time of each of the hamstrings. We did that before and after exercise. Um, and essentially what we saw really verified uh, or, or backed up what we saw in that initial EMG analysis. And that was uh, that we saw significantly more biceps from long head activity uh, in the hip extension exercise uh, than we did in the Nordic. Uh, and the Nordic seemed to preferentially target the semitendinosus and, 
uh, short header biceps femoris. Um, so <laughs> that's a, a long winded explanation for, for how we got, uh, to, to this point. Um, ultimately, uh, from our perspective, at least characterizing the activation patterns of uh, exercises was a really important first step. Um, but ultimately it's uh, the adaptations that count. Um, and it's the effect of these exercises on, on known uh, or proposed risk factors. Uh, so that was really the aim of, uh, of this study here. Cool. So you just want to talk us through the talk us through the paper. Obviously, we've got it on screen, so you can uh, you can highlight anything um, that that requires highlighting. If not, just um, just a little bit of what what you actually did in this paper. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so I'll just scroll through here. Um, I'll, I'll skip over the 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 introduction here, but look, as we know, hamstring hamstring strains are really um, prevalent in sport. Um, and the key point I want to uh, probably drive home here is that the vast majority of these are, are affecting the biceps femoris long head. Um, so the underlying aim of this study was to really determine um, what effect training with different exercises had uh, on this particular muscle. Now, um, we've published, or Ryan Timmons as a part of his uh, very productive PhD, um, published a, a study uh, also in the British Journal of Sports Med, um, which showed that uh, among elite soccer players here in Australia, um, having shorter fascicle lengths in the biceps femoris long head uh, and lower levels of eccentric strength significantly augmented your risk of future hamstring strain injury. Uh, and in fact, based on the results of that study, um, a, a 0.5 centimetre increase in fascicle length actually reduced your uh, risk of injury by 74%. So it was a really significant um, reduction in your likelihood of injury there. Um, so the, the key outcome measure for this study was biceps femoris fascicle length. Um, we also wanted to have a look at strength because we've got some, some and in particular Nordic strength, because uh, as you know, we've got some good evidence that that uh, is a risk factor for injury as well. Uh, and lastly, we've got some evidence, um, although it's not a proven risk factor, we've got some evidence that uh, individuals with a history of hamstring strain injury uh, display persistent atrophy uh, in the long head of biceps femoris as well. So I really wanted to, to look at what effect these exercises have or training with these exercises has on uh, muscle volumes and cross-sectional areas. Um, so to, to briefly take you through it, we, we recruited 30 uh, recreationally active male athletes. Um, these were predominantly exercise science students. Um, we randomized those individuals to one of three groups, either a hip extension training group, uh, a Nordic hamstring training group, or a control group. Now, um, importantly, we, we randomized individuals based on, uh, rest, uh, based on uh, fascicle lengths uh, at baseline. Um, so to explain that very briefly, oops, excuse me, um, we, all participants underwent an assessment of their fascicle length using uh, ultrasound um, before training began. Uh, we then ranked individuals from one to 30. Um, so number one being uh, the individual with the longest fascicles, three to 30 with the shortest. Um, and then we, we uh, allocated those individuals, so the fact that, Individuals with the top three or the longest three fascicles uh, were randomised to one of the three groups. Individuals with the next three uh, were allocated to one of the three groups, so on and so forth. Essentially, that ensured that uh, none of our groups differed significantly um, at baseline in terms of their uh, their resting fascicle length. Um, at baseline, we also took uh, an MRI, or all individuals underwent an assessment of excuse me, uh, of muscle volume. So they all underwent uh, an MRI scan. Um, we acquired uh, what we call T1-weighted images. Um, these are one centimetre thick slices uh, that we obtained from the uh, ischial tuberosity right down to uh, the tibial plateau. Um, and on each of these images, uh, I had the, the very, very laborious task uh, of tracing uh, the individual hamstring muscle bellies 
um, and you know, ultimately summing them all up and, and quantifying muscle volumes. So it really did give us um, a gold standard measure, though, of, of the size of these muscles. Uh, before I forget, uh, this is a, a two-dimensional ultrasound image here that you can see on the left. Uh, this is where we were enabled, where we were able to um, quantify uh, fascicle length. So essentially, uh, you place the ultrasound probe um, over the uh, mid region of the um, biceps femoris uh, long head muscle. Um, you're able to identify very quickly a superficial aponeurosis as well as an intermediate aponeurosis. Now, the distance between those two points uh, we quantify as muscle thickness. You then identify a, a fascicle of interest uh, and put a line along that fascicle. Um, the angle at which it inserts relative to the intermediate aponeurosis is a panation angle. And then uh, using some, well, I won't call it simple, but some, some fairly rudimentary uh, trigonometry, we're able to estimate uh, fascicle length um, from this. So uh, this was all done by uh, Dr. Ryan Timmins, uh, the Australian Catholic Uni down here in Melbourne as well, uh, who's published his reliability and, and published um, quite a number of studies uh, using this methodology. Um, so these were our two major outcome measures. Uh, all of our athletes also underwent an assessment of their eccentric knee flexor strength. And we did that um, using the uh, Nordboard uh, device. Um, uh, and they also underwent an assessment of their strength on the 45 degree hip extension uh, exercise. Um, so these were our, were our outcome measures. In terms of the uh, training itself, uh, these are our two exercises. So the Nordic exercise uh, and the 45 degree hip extension. Now, of course, there were some differences between these exercises. Uh, one was unilateral, one was bilateral. So individuals who were allocated to the hip extension group um, trained each limb uh, in a um, rotating fashion. Um, and we also did attempt to control the, the speed or the tempo of these lifts. In terms of your programming variables, um, all of our individuals, all, all of our participants in training groups completed a, a 10 week uh, progressive intensity program. They train twice a week, uh, and, you know, beginning with two sets of six reps, a fairly low load in, in the first uh, week to two weeks and building right up to five sets of, uh, of eight to 10. We had a drop off in uh, absolute volume in the last couple of weeks to accommodate for increases in exercise intensity. Um, now, in terms of how we modulated uh, load, of course, the Nordic is, is traditionally a body weight uh, assisted exercise or, or body weight uh, exercise. Um, in this particular um, study, we actually gave participants additional load because what we saw was that after a few weeks of training, um, participants were getting really significant improvements in strength um, to the point where they could lower themselves down to the ground and, and simply hover there. Uh, we wanted to ensure that the Nordic was or remained a super maximal exercise. So we gave them load uh, and you can see that down here in, in table two. So once they could stop uh, hover just off the chest, we gave them two and a half kilo plate um, and that was progressively increased. Uh, I think our strongest participant um, at the very end of the study could perform six sets of six reps with the 20 kilo plate on his chest. So they got very significant improvements in strength. Our hip extension exercise, uh, of course it was um, concentric and eccentric, so it wasn't eccentrically biased. Uh, we started off with fairly low loads, about 60 to 70% of one rep max. Um, and then beyond week two, um, all exercise was completed uh, at maximal intensity of effort. Um, so if they did uh, eight sets, uh, sorry, five sets of eight to 10, it was performed at an eight to 10 repetition max load. Okay, um, so I suppose coming down now into the results, uh, and I won't bore you too much with all of the the wording in here, but I'll take you down to the uh, to the figures that we've got. The first one that you see here on the left um, is uh, a graph showing biceps femoris fascicle length uh, in absolute values or centimeters across the y-axis, um, and across the x-axis we've got 
weeks of training. So the little black circle here is our hip extension group. The uh, grayed out square is the Nordic hamstring uh, training group. Uh, and the open triangles is the untrained control. So first thing to notice uh, is you know, given that we randomized participants uh, based on their uh, resting fascicle lengths, no groups differed at baseline. Um, and you can see at week five and at week 10, uh, the control group doesn't change. Um, if you take a look at our training group, so you can see some, some fairly significant increases in fascicle length. So our hip extension group increases uh, roughly a centimetre um, after five weeks, um, slightly more for the Nordic, and both of these groups continue to increase um, out to 10 weeks. I was a little surprised by this finding um, because based off some of our earlier work, uh, fascicle length changes seem to plateau uh, after two to three weeks of training. Um, however, I really think that the progressive overloaded nature of this training protocol um, really accommodated for um, the continual increase. Um, so you can see out here, after 10 weeks of training, our Nordic hamstring group increased fascicle length by about 2.2 uh, centimetres, um, slightly less for our hip extension group. There wasn't actually a significant difference between training groups uh, in this study. Um, and I think that we were perhaps a little bit underpowered uh, to see that, um, but both groups were significantly different from baseline and not significantly different from the control um, at mid and, and post training. Um, I think, again, the, the really interesting uh, take home message from this is that based on our observations in elite soccer players here in Australia, a, a five millimeter increase in fascicle length is sufficient to reduce your risk of hamstring strain by 74%. Um, so, you know, I can't even quantify um, the magnitude of the risk reduction based simply off um, fascicle link changes alone here. Um, I'll come back to this in, in just a second because I just wanted to talk about um, our strength changes. Uh, here is eccentric knee flexor force, which was measured on the, the Nordboard device. Um, again, each of our three uh, or two training groups, hip extension, Nordic, uh, open triangle here is uh, control. See that the groups didn't differ significantly at baseline. Um, after 10 weeks of training, control group doesn't change either, but both our Nordic and our hip extension groups got significantly uh, stronger, um, you know, around about 100 to 150 Newton increase on average. Um, what was really interesting was that the hip extension group also significantly increased strength, um, even though they didn't complete any of the, uh, the Nordic training within that period. Um, we saw a very similar uh, phenomenon after, uh, in terms of hip extension strength as well. So again, no significant change for control, but really, um, really significant improvements in, in hip extension strength from both our training groups. So that really highlighted to, to us that uh, there's perhaps lots of ways uh, to get strong um, and you don't necessarily need to train with, um, with one individual exercise. Uh, coming back just briefly to um, the third of our outcome measures, which was the uh, muscle volume changes. Uh, so here is percentage change in volume, and really this is hypertrophy or an index for hypertrophy across the y-axis. We've got each of our hamstrings here across the x. So the long and short heads of biceps femoris, uh, semitendinosus and semimembranosus here. Black bars are the hip extension group. Gray is obviously Nordic and uh, clear ones are control. Now, what was really interesting here was that the only significant between group difference was here. In terms of our biceps femoris long head hypertrophy, the hip extension group actually increased the size of biceps femoris um, almost twice that of the Nordic hamstring group. So it really suggests that uh, hip extension training may be a more potent stimulus for hypertrophy uh, in this most commonly injured muscle. Okay. The other uh, really interesting finding from this uh, was that the pattern of muscle hypertrophy is almost an exact match to the um, acute T2 response that we observed with functional MRI. 
Um, again, I don't have that paper here, um, but uh, it's, it's a recent publication that British Journal of Sports Med um, titled The Impact of Exercise Selection um, on Hamstring Muscle Activation. Uh, and in that, you can find uh, the graph for each of these two exercises. And it's uh, really the pattern of growth here is indistinguishable from that. Um, so I think it's uh, certainly an area of, of further research there. Uh, in terms of soreness, uh, again, this wasn't a key outcome variable, but here we've got soreness uh, on the Y weeks of training across the X axis for each of our training groups. And uh, really the, the key message I want to drive home is that um, neither training modalities or neither exercises um, caused uh, significant increases in, in soreness or pain. Um, and this is really in line with a lot of the other uh, research that's been done, uh, for example, by Milner's and colleagues, uh, and also Jesper Peterson's um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the other uh, Nordic hamstring RCT, which reported that uh, progressive increase in intensity and volume um, can be achieved without uh, while minimising um, soreness across the intervention period. Uh, Yes, that's it. Did you want? No, that's uh, cool. No, that's cool, mate. Absolutely, that's that's brilliant. That's fantastic. So, just yeah. just before we um, kind of round up, what what were the limitations to this? Yeah, certainly. Um, so I just jumped down to here. I suppose uh, perhaps one of the biggest limitations of, of this study is that uh, um, our group of participants were recreationally active uh, athletes. Uh, and they weren't um, they weren't elite, uh, and certainly that's uh, a consideration that was brought up by um, reviewers, and and certainly in a in a clinical or an applied <laughs> setting, um, uh, those are issues that people are going to have. Um, I think what's worth noting though is that our participants uh, were on average as strong as elite Australian football players, and in fact we were or, or our cohort was stronger than uh, professional soccer players here in Australia at the start of the study. Um, they also displayed um, fascicle lengths, uh, which were on average uh, with one, within one standard deviations, uh, with, sorry, within one st standard deviation um, of the values that we've reported in soccer players or elite soccer players previously. Um, so while our, while our cohort wasn't, uh, for the lead athletes, they um, certainly weren't under representative of high level or more highly trained athletes in these uh, particular parameters. Um, I think one of the other limitations is that uh, our um, measurements of fascicle length, um, of course, require some degree of estimation um, because we can't always view the entire length uh, of a fascicle uh, within an ultrasound image. Um, so, we used an equation uh, which has been validated against cadaveric, uh, cadaveric, excuse me, samples. Um, so to you know really avoid um, some of that error, but there is always the potential um, for that error. Uh, I guess future studies uh, really need to employ, or can attempt to apply, employ more robust measures such as uh, panoramic um, ultrasound or extended field of view ultrasound. Uh, methods um, to get a, a more uh, accurate uh, measure of fascicle length. Um, those are those are probably the the two major limitations that I that I would point out from from okay. this end. No, that's cool, mate. So, just two last things. Uh, yeah. Firstly, where can where can people get hold of the paper? And secondly, uh, what's coming up next for you in terms yeah, of research? Sure. Um, okay, so this this paper was uh, published. Uh, just recently at the end of last month um, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Um, so it's uh, it's available online uh, now. Um, cool. I'll put, a, I'll put a link on it on the, on the video as well. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Um, I guess in terms of what's coming next, we, we certainly have uh, a number of um, uh, research questions which probably stem from this research and, and uh and other research that our group's been been working on. I think there's lots more to be done in the exercise analysis uh, field. Um, perhaps most importantly relates to uh, the dose or the optimal dose response, um, or perhaps I should rephrase that, the minimum dose response. 
uh, that uh, in terms of the, the, the quantity of exercise that we need to be doing to elicit these changes. So I, I think certainly in, in elite sport, one of the barriers to uptake, uh, particularly with Nordics, uh, is the fact that um, uh, coaches, clinicians, uh, physical therapists, um, often argue that they can't implement the exercise effectively um, in conjunction with all the other training loads. Um, certainly, you know, if you're doing high volumes of uh, eccentric or eccentrically biased training in conjunction with uh, loads of running um, and other weight training, there's a potential for soreness, um, so on and so forth. So um, I think one question certainly is around what is the minimum amount of exercise that we can do to elicit these changes? Uh, Joel Presland, who's uh, one of David Opar, Dr. David Opar's uh, PhD students down here in Melbourne, um, has been working on answering that. Uh, he's actually got some preliminary data from his honours, um, which compared a uh, low volume uh, to a high volume Nordic um, hamstring exercise program. Um, his outcome measures were, were similar to this, or this study. So he's looked at fascicle length changes as well as uh, eccentric knee flexor strength changes across the training period. Um, and what was uh, what's really interesting from that data is that a low volume um, program elicits almost the exact same adaptations as a higher volume training. Uh, in terms of the higher volume training, it was more or less indistinguishable from the program that um, we've done in this study. Uh, the low volume um, started off, uh, I think, quite similar to our training in the first couple of weeks, um, but then they dropped down to one session a week of two sets of four repetitions. So they were simply performing eight reps of Nordics a week, um, and at the end of uh, an eight-week training period, um, the architectural and strength changes were indistinguishable between groups. Uh, so I think it really suggests that... Uh, you know, we can get away with, with using far lower volumes. Um, and that might be a really important factor in encouraging, um, uptake and compliance, mm -hmm. um, particularly in elite sport. Uh, nice. Nice. No, yeah. Something interesting. That's, that's superb. So where can, where can people, um, keep up to date with what you've got going on personally? I know you, I know you put all these, um, all the links and things on Twitter. What, where can people find you on Twitter? Yeah, sure. Um, tw Twitter is probably, uh, the best avenue to get in touch. Um, so my, I think my Twitter name is mborn5. Uh, um, so, yeah, uh, feel free to follow me. It's probably the best way to shoot any questions um, or queries you might have and, and certainly an avenue for, um, for discussion about some of this uh, stuff as well. Perfect. Well, thanks for your time, mate. And uh, apologies for turning up an hour late. <laughs> That's all right. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks, thanks for your time. No worries, yeah. mate. Speak to you soon.